So now on to the study which supports this first theory uh, in social influence. So the study that links to situational factors. Um, so I'm going to use the slides here. Those of you that are in my um, class, you'll have uh, these on Google Classroom, so you can access them there. Um, those of you that aren't, hopefully you'll be able to read them on the board, find, pause the video or whatever you need. Also, uh, if you are in my class, this is the point where you need to get out your A3 summary sheet. Now, um, these again are on Google Classroom. Uh, for those of you that aren't in my class, I will put a link to this file in the description. It's just a nice structure to help you um, kind of, I guess, condense all this information into uh, the parts that are most relevant and most important. So let's dive into it. The lead researcher on this was Bickman. And this study was done in 1974. And uh, the title of the study is The Social Power of Uniform. So, what we are looking at here is a theory that does link to situational factors, but most specifically, it is talking about authority and obedience to authority figures. And as we've discussed previously, different people have different authority in different levels and in different contexts. What Bigman was interested in is how that authority is actually conveyed, because he suspected that there are a few key features which kind of give us a bit of a cue for whether or not we're going to obey somebody. And the one that he was interested in in this particular study was uniform. Now, you can probably think off the top of your head of lots of situations where a person with authority has a uniform which is associated with that. So the police is a great example, somebody in the military, even the queen. All these people have outfits, things that they wear, which give them authority. Um, the hypothesis behind this study, um, this at the moment is stated as an alternative hypothesis, and that is that a uniformed guard, so Bickman chose to use a guard uniform, which is similar to a police uniform, but not official. You're not allowed to wear a fake police uniform. So a uniform guard has more ability to influence others or cause them to obey than the same person wearing a low authority uniform. So for example, um, in this study, a milkman was the low authority uniform. It's still a uniform, it's recognizable, but you wouldn't associate a milkman with having particular authority, whereas you might in a guard. So have a think, um, you should be able always to work out what the IV and the DV, independent and dependent variables, are in a study from the hypothesis. Equally, if you are given variables, you should be able to turn them into a hypothesis, either alternative or null. So alternative hypothesis here, we're saying the uniform will have an influence on a person's uh, behavior or obedience. So the independent variable, the thing we are gonna change, or the thing we're saying is the cause of this uh, effect, is the uniform, and then the dependent variable, the thing that's dependent on that uniform, should be the level of obedience. If we were to state this as a null hypothesis, we would simply say the uniform that a person is wearing will have no effect on the level of obedience, because we're saying there's no effect. That's what the null hypothesis means. This study is a little bit complicated, and actually the sheet that I use for all of the studies um, doesn't fit very well with this one simply because there were quite a few steps or a few like sub studies in this one. So we're going to talk about the main study and that's what you want to fill in your sheet with and then on the back of your sheet or on another bit of paper it's worth adding a few notes because there were other sections to this study which were done after which I'll explain afterward. The conclusions and criticisms um, are all combined, but the rest, the procedure and materials, those are separate for the separate studies. It'll make sense once I've explained it. So to get you started, experiment one, the design of this experiment was a field experiment. It was done out in a real life situation. So the experimenter were out on the streets of New York and it was a field experiment and not a natural experiment because even though it was out in a real world scenario, they were still controlling the independent variable. The participants was an opportunity sample, which means that they were just whoever was conveniently passing by at the time, 
and the sample consisted of 153 adult pedestrians. Um, the age was estimated because these people were just randomly approached on the street. They actually didn't know that they were part of a study and so um, their age wasn't asked. So I don't know who estimated that someone was 61 years old, it's strangely specific. But anyway, um, and the materials that were needed, well, there were three different um, actors or confederates who were part of this study. Those were the people who were actually out on the streets talking to people. But they all wore the same three outfits, okay? Uh, one of those outfits was a guard's uniform that I've already mentioned. The other was a milkman uniform. And then the third was just smart clothing, similar to what a teacher would wear. I think probably they had a jacket as well. That sounds quite formal, but I would imagine on the streets of New York, that would be a fairly typical outfit. Um, so it wouldn't carry the same authority that it might say in a business situation where you would expect someone to be dressing smart because they're at work. Onto the procedure then. There's a fair bit of information in this section. So there were four, I lied to you, I said three. There were four um, confederates. They weren't actually the, ex they were in the experiment, but they, they hadn't written the study. They were nothing to do with big men. They didn't actually know what the purpose of the study was. And that was done deliberately to try and avoid any demand characteristics or any um, experimenter bias where because the people acting knew what the experimenter was hoping to find and knew the hypothesis, they might behave differently. So for example, if you knew the purpose of this study, when you're wearing the guard uniform, you might be more assertive and you might speak more clearly and confidently and that might have an effect on people's obedience, not just the uniform. It was important that they didn't know what the experiment was about. They were all the same size and build, again for obvious reasons. If you had somebody who was massive and tall and muscly, maybe tattoos all over the face or whatever, really scary looking, that might have an influence on how much people obeyed. Um, something you'll have spotted straight away is there is a bit of a gender bias in this study in that all the people expecting the obedience, these experimenters, were all male. So actually we can't generalize this study and these results to how people will obey women in uniform. So they were all the same size and build and they were all told to perform the same three tasks wearing the three different outfits that we mentioned previously. And um, they, each, they each approached roughly the same number of people in each of those different combinations. Um, these are some examples of some of the kinds of research methods questions that you may be asked. So they're not actually relevant to the study in terms of the content, but it's something you could be asked to calculate. So good to have a think at least, how would you calculate that? Do you know how to work out those answers? There are three different scenarios which were being uh, tested for people up for obedience. Um, the first one was the picking up a bag situation. And this very simply, the experimenter approached a pedestrian and asked them to pick up a paper bag that was, uh, that was on the floor. If the pedestrian didn't immediately respond or obey, then the experimenter would add, oh, I've got a bad back. So kind of giving a, an excuse as to why they are not gonna, gonna pick up this bag. Second situation, giving a dime, not to up on my American money, I believe a dime, it's like 10p, maybe 5p. It's a small amount of currency. In this situation, the experimenter approached a pedestrian and asked them to lend a dime to another actor who was pretending to not have any money to pay for parking. Um, if, again, the pedestrian didn't respond, then they would say, oh, I don't have, I ain't got any money, otherwise I would. And then the third one, the bus stop scenario, the experimenter asked, uh, it had to be a lone pedestrian, so they approached a single person standing at the bus stop and they said to them, um, oh, you've got to stand on the other side of this pole. So there's kind of like a, a pole at the front of the bus stop and it had a sign on that says no standing. Now, standing is the American phrase for like parking your car and just kind of waiting. So a little bit like we would have like double yellows or whatever, you're not allowed to stop there. They have this sign that says no standing. Presumably most people would know that, but the experimenter was kind of pretending that it meant you weren't allowed to actually stand on one side of that pole um, if they didn't respond, then the experimenter would say, it's a new law, the bus won't stop. 
So these three random scenarios are just designed to give people an opportunity to either obey or not. Summary of the results is here. Hopefully you can see that. It's not the best projector in the world, but um, essentially the green column represents the obedience um, percentages of uh, people when they were wearing the guard uniform. So straight away you can see that the guard was obeyed the most. Second was the milkman. So interestingly, even though the milkman uniform has nothing to do with authority, you know, a milkman can't actually force you to do anything, um, people still obeyed the milkman a little bit more than the person just wearing a formal suit. Um, you can also see the differences in these scenarios as well. So people were most willing to obey, um, on average, the paper bag and the dime situation. Now, maybe because those were, those didn't just rely purely on obedience. They were both situations where actually whether you, want, whether you were a nice person or not would make a difference. So maybe you would feel sorry for someone with a bad back or feel sorry for someone who couldn't pay for their parking. So maybe you weren't really obeying so much as just being decent. In the last situation, there's no real decency about it. There's not anyone who is clearly benefiting in that situation. So in some sense, the bus stop scenario is the best one for testing obedience because it is pure obedience. There's a much less to do with your personal disposition involved in that. And, and I think that explains why it had lower conformity across all variations. But as you can see, still more than double uh, obeyed the guard than either of the other two uniforms. Those are the results from part one of the experiment. Going on now to the second bit, uh, experiment part two. So this is again separate. So don't put this, unless you've got a different colour to write in, don't put it on that same A3 sheet because it'll kind of confuse things. What Bigman was also interested in was kind of finding out some of the background around obeying. And what he looked at was, does it matter if the, if the authority figure actually checks to make sure they are being obeyed. Now, as a teacher, I've got a fairly strong intuition that it does make a difference. People are much less likely to obey if they know that they're going to get away with it and there's not going to be any consequence. No one's going to check on them. People don't do it. Uh, teachers who don't check whether students do homework generally have students who don't do homework. Um, only extremely self-motivated students will still do it when they know it's not going to be checked. However, that's not relevant to what Bickman found. Bickman recreated the dime experiment. This time, half of the participants were watched by the experimenter. So the person who'd asked the pedestrian to lend the dime stood there and watched them to see if they lent it. And then the other half, they, they didn't. They asked if they would lend it and then walked off. Um, he called this surveillance and found that it didn't have any effect on obedience. However, you may be able to, and I certainly can think of a couple of flaws with this experiment. First of all, they're not being observed by the person who asked, but they're still being observed by the actor who is hoping to receive the dime. So you would feel pretty tight, you know, if I was asked to lend someone some money, the person who asked me to lend it walked off, and then as soon as they're gone, I just walk off and ignore the person who stood there expectingly, hoping that I'm going to give them a dime. So th they didn't really d d think about this very well because they were still being observed, just not by the same person who'd asked them. Um, so I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that, but you need to know that they did it and they found it didn't make any difference. Experiment three, now the third section is split up again into a couple of little parts, but they're all fairly small. And it's basically a way of Bickman trying to prove that what they were testing had construct validity. In other words, they were trying to prove that they really were testing obedience and not testing anything else. So they asked a lot of students, 141, um, about some scenarios. They gave them 29 different potential obedience scenarios. And what they wanted to know was if the students thought that it was a legitimate request of any of the uniforms, um, f uh, that it was like linked to that task. So what I mean by that is, if the milkman was maybe asking somebody to return a milk bottle 
That could be seen as a legitimate task because you could, you could imagine that that has something to do with the milkman's job. So he's kind of got authority over milk bottles, so that's legitimate. Or for example, if they did this in a store and they had the guard asking somebody to exit through a different door. In the store, a guard has authority, so it would be legitimate. What Bickman wanted to know is, will people obey someone in uniform, even if that uniform has nothing to do with the situation? So that was why they gave all these different scenarios and they wanted to find the situation which was not relevant to the uniform that was being worn. The students didn't think the guard was more legitimate and so that's why these three scenarios were chosen. So they asked another 189 students, but a different set, um, how they would respond to those scenarios. So they were asked, if you were standing at a bus stop and a man in a guard uniform came up and asked you to stand on the other side of the pole, would you? And people said, no, it wouldn't make any difference whether you're a milkman, dressed in a suit or a guard, I'm, I'm not gonna listen to you any different in that situation. Um, that was what people said. And this illustrates a really important feature of psychology and it illustrates the importance of doing experiments. And that is, people are generally rubbish at predicting how they will respond in a situation. Um, our mind is so complicated and there are so many levels of conscious and subconscious and unconscious that we actually don't really understand why we do the things that we do let alone being able to predict what we will do in a hypothetical situation. Um, you just don't know until you put in that scenario. And that's why we have to perform experiments like this. And that's why it's important that they feel as natural as possible. So that's why Bickman had to deceive these people. Because if they'd known it was an experiment, people wouldn't have behaved naturally and we would be none the wiser. Those are now the three sections uh, complete. That is all of the procedure and the results of those uh, experiments. Now we're kind of wrapping this all together. So the conclusions, and this, these conclusions apply to all of those studies. First of all, wearing a uniform does increase your social power it gives you greater ability to influence whether people listen to you or not. Uh, if you're interested, there's a really good um, video that I think BBC Three put on YouTube a while ago where they got somebody to wear a high-vis jacket and go out into the town and just give people totally random requests. And they repeat it without the high-vis jacket and, and it made a huge difference. So they didn't, it wasn't um, a proper experiment in that you know there wasn't control variables and it wasn't all statistically analyzed but just anecdotally you could see people were far more willing to obey when uh, when she had a clipboard and a high-vis jacket uh, interestingly it was a woman as well which gives us the ability to kind of now generalize if we look at the two studies together we can see that uniform does increase your power whether you're male or female higher status uniforms increase the power to cause obedience so if you are dressed as a policeman, you are much more likely to have somebody obey than if you are dressed as a milkman or a McDonald's worker or whatever. Third, what people think they will do is not a good predictor of what they will actually do. Uh, and again, like I say, I can't overstate the importance of this just for psychology generally, but even for yourself, you know, don't assume that you know how you will behave. And then finally, um, Situational factors, i.e. the uniform, do have an effect on behaviour, even if people don't think that they will. And so that's linking the study back into this theory uh, that we've been talking about. The criticisms of the theory are more to do with the problems with the actual kind of the background and how this fits into the different debates in psychology. Criticisms of the study are research methods issues. So they are to do with what is the problem with how this study was conducted, not with the ideas behind the study. So for example, uh, there were quite a few issues with the sample that was used in this study. Here I've asked you to name two, hopefully you can, pause the video and give it a go. Uh, if not, I'm going to tell you anyway. So opportunity sampling is an issue because the people who participated were chosen out of convenience. 
Now, if you just put yourself in the situation of this experimenter, if you having to approach someone and ask them to obey you, you're more likely to approach some people than others. You're more likely to approach people who look friendly, seem to be in a good mood, don't look like they're going to stab you. And so you're not going to get a representative sample because there are certain types of people who could not have possibly been in that study. Um, first of all, you had to be walking around New York, so there's a cultural bias there. We don't know how people in different countries, different cities, even just not in cities, you know, people in the countryside, we don't know how they would react in these situations. Um, so the cultural bias, because it was all in New York, and then also, like I said, there is definitely a, uh, a bias because of that opportunity sample. You wouldn't have had population validity. Second criticism, um, you could consider it unethical. Um, there was no consent gained, and there was deception involved. And particularly in the situation where you had to give the dime, I'm not really sure what happened to that dime. Did the guy, did the actor just collect all those dimes and, well, hey, you know, we've just basically scammed a lot of people. So that could be classed as unethical. It's not clear from the information that I've got whether there was a debriefing. So whether they like caught up with the people afterward and said, it was all just a fake, you know, we, we were just studying this and explained um, that they should have done. Maybe they did, but it doesn't say in the textbook. Um, Gender bias, I already mentioned, all of the experimenters, the people requesting the obedience were all male. So we don't know from this study whether there's a gender effect there. And then finally, field experiments, they give us very little control over extraneous variables. So for example, um, if it was raining, that would probably affect people's willingness to stop and help somebody else. We don't know about that. And so there are lots of other little extraneous variables, the things that you'd call control variables in science, stuff that might not have been the same between all those scenarios that we don't know about because it was done in the field rather than in a lab. Of course, it had to be done in the field, otherwise it wouldn't have worked, but it's still fine to point out that there are drawbacks to that approach. You're never going to need to know four criticisms, so I would commit two to memory. That's the maximum I've ever seen on an exam paper you'd be asked to know. And that is the theory and the study of situational factors all wrapped up. So it was important that these four didn't 